uh, with the Fellowship of Reconciliation. And um, uh, we, this is the fourth uh, of Militarism Watch webinars in order to strengthen research skills on U.S. militarism in ways that serve activism. And today we're, we're really happy to have uh, Nick Schwellenbach, uh, who directs investigations for the Project on Government Oversight, in order to uh, take a good look at, at how to research military contracts. So um, first, a, a bit of a, a groundwork for all of you. Um, you have been uh, muted just so that uh, there isn't a lot of background noise. Um, if you would like to speak or get, send us a message, there is a chat box that you can open. If you go to the green bar at the top of your screen uh, and hover your cursor over it and open the chat box, um, you can send a message either uh, to me at FORUSA uh, uh, or you can share it with everyone. Um, and I highly encourage you, as Nick goes over his presentation, to uh, make questions and comments in the chat box, and then we will have time uh, towards the end of the presentation to, to review those and respond to them. Um, and if you really want to say something and really interact, um, just ask to be unmuted um, at the end of the presentation, and we can have some conversation. Uh, this will be recorded, um, and so we will be posting this uh, webinar um, after it is done. So um, without further ado, I'm going to um, turn it over to, to Nick. And again, th thanks, Nick, for, for doing this with us today. Hey, happy to be here. Um, you know, as John mentioned, uh, my name is Nick Schwellenbach. I work at the Project on Government Oversight, or POGO. And uh, today I'll be you know, bas basically running you through some of the basic steps uh, a researcher would take if they want to learn about military contracts either more broadly or in your in your community or your state. So we'll just dive into it. What we'll cover, cover today is, you know, who I am, I've already told you, and uh, I'll briefly explain why you should care about military contracting, uh, how much is spent, who's getting the money, who's getting contracts where you live, what those contracts are for, or how to figure that out, how to learn about contractor misconduct, and some ways to learn about uh, contractors and whether or not they're selling up abroad. So these are the basic things we're going to cover today in the next 40 minutes or so. And as John mentioned, we'll have a Q&A at the end, and I'm sure some of you will have questions. So why you should care? Uh, basically, it's a to start with, it's a lot of money. I mean, it's it's uh, on the on the right. Uh, a lot of people believe that the U.S. spends a majority of its money on foreign aid. Um, and that's not true whatsoever, and a majority of that foreign aid is foreign military aid, much of it which is used to buy weapons from our contractors or other uh, nations' defense contractors. Contracting offers a window into what the U.S. is doing. The Defense Department's not known as the most transparent government agency, but uh, luckily we have what little info we do have on their contracts. And so by following the money, we can at least get an inkling of what the U.S. is up to in many places around the world. Um, contractors are also doing more and more work um, uh, as a share of the overall work done uh, on behalf of the government. And, and actually, contractors at the Defense Department are making more than civilians in, in uniform personnel even. And, and we'll, I'll show you a little bit of info on that later. Uh, it introduces the profit motive directly into war making itself. Um, you know, defense contractors, the traditional defense contractors that built tanks and planes, could sell tanks and planes even if they weren't used. Uh, however, companies like Blackwater and Halliburton actually need hot wars to, for the, so, so their services are needed. Without actual ongoing live wars, they, you know, they don't have something to sell. And then there are also related issues to misconduct and uh, the difficulty in holding these contractors accountable. So how much money? A lot of it. Government-wide, um, and this is the entire federal government, not just the Defense Department, uh, expenditures on, on contracts have more than doubled from over $200 billion to well over $500 billion from fiscal year 2000 to 2010. 
and most government contracting is through the Defense Department. Um, this chart here uh, was created by uh, a place I used to work at, the Center for Public Integrity, and they took a look at defense contracting growth over the last decade and what share of it was uh, awarded on the basis of competition versus no-bid contracts. And so, you know, as you can see, well, there's probably been a little bit of improvement in the percentage of contracts awarded with competition. Um, they're still not doing great. Uh, you know, a good third or more of contracts are awarded on a sole source basis. And we'll get into that a little bit more later and how to, how to look for that. But, and this is a major caveat here, some work for the DOD that's done by contractors is actually awarded through other agencies. Um, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but this is important to keep in mind when you're looking at the total amount of dollars that, that DOD contracts out. You know, here's an example of you know, the contractor CACI, which was implicated in the Abu Ghraib prison scandal in Iraq. Uh, you know, they were they had some interrogators in the prison and the contract was actually awarded by the Interior Department, you know, and we normally don't think of the Interior Department in relation to, you know, wars or even any work overseas. They're, you know, typically managing federal lands here here back at home, but uh, many contracts are awarded through, you know, special vehicles, you know, with terms called such as blanket purchase agreement where another department will award the contract but the, but the contractor will provide services to other agencies and you know you may have a question about that later i won't spend too much time on that but but keep that in mind uh it's an important thing uh in terms of the landscape of government contracting and you've probably heard at least a little bit about uh possible tiny reductions in the pentagon's budget uh the president's budget request which came out on monday this week uh, lower spending on the Defense Department's base budget about 1% from last year. Uh, that's not including uh, supplemental war spending on the wars abroad. This is just you know, just the Defense Department's budget. And, and as you may know, the Defense Department's budget has increased by over 60% in real dollars since 9-11. And moving forward, you know, the Defense Department wants to protect uh, its its contractors. And here you have a recent quote from the current Defense Secretary, Leon Panetta, where he says he wants to preserve their health, um, which I think we know what that means. They don't want to cut too deeply into the bottom lines of, of at least the more important contractors. So wh what's bought through contracts? Two main things, goods, um, and it could be everything from a joint strike fighter, as you see here, to paper clips, um, you know, goods are tangible things that you can buy and then the other type of thing you can buy through contracts are services and here i have this image of a purportedly a blackwater employee screaming or yelling uh and that's probably a, a more notorious example of a of a service contract uh and that and most blackwater contracts were through the state department not the defense department by the way but you know everything from translation to intelligence analysis to secretaries are being contracted out, and um, you know there's a there's a concept uh, related to service contracting called inherently governmental functions, and it's a very fuzzy concept. And supposedly, the government tries not to or is not supposed to contract out key functions that are critical to government decision making. But um, people have found through in recent years that that many key functions are being outsourced, and so there's a Many people are concerned about, you know, how does a democracy work when a profit-making company is controlling some key levers in the government or at least shaping perceptions within uh, decision-making circles. Service con I want to spend a little bit of time on, on the importance of service contracts because the DOD is spending even more on those now than on contracts for goods. And the DOD even spends more on service contractor employees than it does on its own employees. Uh, you know, and those are defined by both uniformed personnel as well as the civilian personnel. And this is a DOD chart. This is in our chart. This is uh, from inside the Pentagon. And this chart makes it pretty clear that even inside the Pentagon, there are some people who think 
things have gone too far. Um, you know, this is from the Personnel and Readiness Office at DOD, and they say the savings are here. They don't even know exactly how much money is being spent on service contractors. They're estimating about $250 billion compared to $220 million or $20 billion for civilians and uniformed. But, you know, it's, it's – and this is as of – fiscal year 2010, so this number is probably bigger now. So even the DODs has some concerns, or some quarters within the DOD are concerned about how much they're spending on service contractors. And this is, this is a very nerdy part of the presentation, uh, and I won't spend too much time here, but there are different types of contract vehicles. Um, you have your traditional fixed price contracts, you know, that's what people normally think of when they think of a contract. Uh, I agree to pay you X number of dollars, and you agree to provide a good or service for, for that amount of money, and it's a legally binding agreement. And there's another type of contract called a cost-type contract. That's usually more open-ended. You know, I've determined I need services from a contractor, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sign this contract, you know, with the expectation that I will, as needed, request things from that contractor. And there, there's some agreement about, you know, okay, well, I know you, you'll you provide laundry services for me, but I'm not quite sure how many times you need to do laundry for me. So we'll agree on a billing rate. Um, and, and sometimes there are clauses included for inflation or, you know, unexpected costs, which could affect the contractor. But cost-type contracts are a little bit uh, more loosey-goosey. That said, fixed-price contracts can change. Sorry, I did that just now, and let me go back. Here we go, but we'll move on. So who's getting the money? Normally, the best place to go is a website called usaspending.gov. You, re you might, or might not remember the 2008 presidential campaign, and in that campaign, then-Senator Obama uh, referred to a website he helped to create through legislation call, and, and he kept referring it to, to it as a Google for government. Uh, it was really this website, usaspending.gov. It's not quite as easy to use as Google, uh, but it was but was a great advance for government transparency in terms of you know, where, where the money is going. And normally, I would be taking you through the steps on how to search usaspending.gov, but unfortunately, usaspending.gov, as of at least an hour ago, was having technical difficulties and was not allowing me to use it and likely wouldn't allow you to use it as well. Um, normally, it's up, but, but this happens with usaspending.gov, and it has some of its own problems besides this, but I won't get into those now. So instead, there are some other alternatives. Um, there's a website called fedspending.org, which was created by a group called OMB Watch. Uh, OMB Watch is not maintaining fedspending.org anymore. It was the model for usaspending.gov. usaspending.gov has features that fedspending.org did not have, and you know, it, is, it is kept up to date. Um, however, fedspending.org just doesn't have good info past 2008 now. Then there's the Federal Procurement Data System, and we're going to use that a bit today. Uh, we're actually going to use both of these today, but the Federal Procurement Data System is actually the source for usaspending.gov. It's just not as user-friendly. So we'll move on to these websites, and I'll show you how to use them. So if you go to the Federal Procurement Data System, which is HTTPS colon backslash backslash www.fpds.gov, you'll see a screen like this. Um, you can log in, but you don't have to. Um, there's a, a Google-like font, Google-like search box right here in the middle. And let's just start off, say you're interested in uh, um, unmanned aerial vehicles. So we'll just put in air, unmanned aerial, and we'll hit enter. Let's just see what comes up. Unmanned aerial vehicles being a hot topic these days um, for, for their role in Afghanistan and Pakistan and elsewhere. So we can get a sense of, well, who's working on unmanned aerial vehicles? Now, also keep in mind what's coming up is our only results where 
those magic words are used. So, you know, we've got some stuff here. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side the top departments that are uh, awarding contracts that use the term unmanned aerial. So you've got DOD, not a surprise there. You've got NASA, which when you think about it isn't that surprising because it's not just about space but about aeronautics. You've got the General Services Administration, and you might wonder, well, what's their interest and who 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 are the GSA? The GSA is is sort of a sort of a jack of all trades, if you will, within the federal government. They do things like lease you know office space to agencies. They maintain a, a schedule where they have a list of approved contractors. Um, so if you need paper clips in a pinch, you just go to, over to GSA's schedule and you look up their approved paperclip suppliers and you can just quickly order paper clips. So that may be why they're involved here. There may be contracts related to unmanned aerial vehicles that GSA is sort of administering. Then you've got the Department of Homeland Security, which wants to operate drones on the border. And you've got some other departments, and far fewer contracts are being awarded by them, and it's not necessarily clear what agriculture's role is, but, but that could be explored. And then you've got top contracting agencies. So this is usually uh, where things, these are the people who actually award the contract, and they're within these departments above. And I won't spend too much time on that. But you kind of come down, you can see who are the top vendors that are getting contracts where unmanned aerial comes up. So you got Tybrin. So the biggest one might be uh, a company called uh, General Atomics. They make the Predator drone, and they're not coming up here. So that might be because we're not using the right search term. So let's go back up here and put in General Atomics and see what comes up. So General Atomics is getting a lot of contracts in the Department of Defense, over 4,000, and probably for things out for, for more than just UAVs, but you can just scroll down and you can see all the contracts listed here, and they have them page by page, 30 per page, but they have over 5,000. So obviously this is very unwieldy and a researcher wouldn't want to scroll through probably hundreds and hundreds of pages. So one of the better ways to comb through this info is if you go sort of on the right-hand side towards the top of the page, there's a link so you can export all of these 5,500 entries as an Excel spreadsheet. And so I recommend that when people want to look at, say, all of General Atomics contracts or information on those contracts, Download it as a, as a spreadsheet, and, and, and I'll show you why. It makes it much more, uh, it's easier to slice and dice the info there and, and get a better sense of what's going on. So it's, the little thing is, is working here. And normally you can do all this, all the same types of things in usaspending.gov. It's just more user friendly. No, it's not letting me save that. So what we can do here. Maybe if we just look at their DOD contracts, which is a slightly smaller set of information. So let's try to do this again. So it's downloading this time. Nick, while you're waiting for that to download, someone asks uh, what it means when an action obligation is negative. What that means is it could mean a lot of things. It could mean that there was a paperwork snafu and they sent more money. It could mean that the contract came in under what they thought it would. Um, so they may have said, hey, we need this much money. And then when the work was done, they didn't obligate all the money, and so the contractor sends some of it back. I mean, it could mean a lot of different things, and you will occasionally see that. You may actually often see it. And sometimes there are action obligations of of zero, and that doesn't necessarily mean nothing's happening, like, for instance, this one. 
It might mean there was a small change in the contract. So let's actually that's that that raises a great point since we're having trouble with the Excel download. Let's just take a look at at some of these action obligations. What's there? So this is from 2003. And it's an action obligation from the Air Force to General Dynamics or General Atomics to their Electromagnetic Systems Division. And so there's a lot of information here. Some of it's more useful than than other types of information. And and I and I caution anyone researching contracts to take what they see as a starting point for research. Um, you know. You know, you may see something that looks shocking or surprising, uh, and, and it, it very well may be, but you might also want to check. You probably should check, if you can, with, with, with the government. Sometimes they're tough to get to, but if, you have, if you've done your homework, sometimes you can get some questions answered. And so if you go here, you can get a better sense of what they want. They wanted research and development in the physical engineering and life sciences, which is very vague. There's a little bit more info, electronics and communication equipment. But if you start to look at, and I'll show you something here. So each of these is an action obligation, but each action obligation is associated with the award ID, which is the contract. So there may be one contract, but they dole out money over the life of that contract. And so if you click on this, we'll see all the actions associated with this one contract award. And so as you can see here, there are 17 listed. And so this one action obligation in 04 was over 4 million. There was a slight adjustment here of 15,000. And so you can see sort of the life of this contract over time, you know, through 2006, through 2007. And so if you, if you download this as an Excel spreadsheet, what you can see is you can see the dollar amounts they're giving General Atomics for work on this one particular contract over the course of several years. And so you can see if it's growing, if it's shrinking, um, and you can look and see if they've awarded other contracts that are similar. So maybe one contract comes to an end, but they award a much bigger contract later on. That's usually, an, usually indicative that the Defense Department thinks oh, there's something there, and they want to pour more money into whatever project it is. And so that's, you know, if you have that in an Excel spreadsheet, you can see that those trends more readily if you start organizing it by date or by contract number, and, and that becomes, you know, easier to slice and dice, as I mentioned earlier. So let's get to a more user-friendly website than FPDS. This is fedspending.org which I mentioned earlier was the model for usaspending.gov, which right now isn't working. So they allow you to look at sort of three types of spending, and we're going to look at contracts. Um, I don't want to get into the other two, although a lot of recovery dollars were contracts as well. And what's really great about fedspending.org is you can look at contracting by place of performance or state. That's where the, the work actually happens. Or you can look at awards by contractor state or, or contractor district. So say you want to look at who's doing work in your congressional district, um, which is a, a, a great question for, for citizens to ask, you know, who's getting money in my district and, and what are they doing? So let's take a look at, say, um, Buck McKean, who's the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee. Let's see what contractors are doing work in his congressional district. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, this data has some, or this website has some data limitations. It really kind of maxes out at 2008. But you can do the same sorts of things in usaspending.gov, and it's more up to date than what this website. So, what you'll get at first, if you look by place of performance by congressional district, <coughs> is you'll get this summary page. And you'll see the top five products or services sold in Buck McKean's district, in his congressional district, the top five contracting agencies purchasing from contractors in Buck McKean's district. And you have the Air Force as number one, Army number two, Navy number three. 
to the Defense Logistics Agency, number four, and the Federal Bureau of Prison System is, is number five, a distant number five. And you can see the top ten contractors that are doing work in Buck McKean's congressional district. You know, as you can see here, Northrop Grumman has well over six hundred million dollars of work in Buck McKean's district. And so this is sort of very top level information. Um, but if you want to get more detailed, you go to this box on the right hand side and you change the level of detail from summary to We'll do extensive. We won't do complete because that might take some time to download, and we'll go there. <coughs> so what this does is it basically spits out all the contract award information for Buck McKean's district in fiscal year 2008. And so you can see everything from you know relatively small dollar amount transactions, you know $9,000, to to much larger contract awards, such as, you know, that's 24,000. You know, you get some big ones eventually. But what's here, and I'll, I'll explain what you're seeing here in a second. So let's just look up Northrop because they had some of the bigger ones. We'll do a search of find north. Let's see, does this spill out everything? Let's see, it's still loading. There are probably thousands of awards just in fiscal year 2008 alone, just in this one congressional district. So it can take a while to load. And you can see this on the right hand side, this keeps growing and growing and growing. So we'll let that grow and I'll show you what we have here. So what you can see is here's a, a, a roughly $4,000 contract by the Department of Justice, its Bureau of Prisons Division, to a company called Access Security for color monitors, probably for an office or for possibly the, a prison. You can see where the vendor's based out of, Leesburg, Virginia. So they're selling or they're doing work in California. It's categorized very oddly as chemical and chemical products. So either computer monitors is wrong or this is coded wrong down here. And this is very common in this contract information is you have a lot of data problems where information is just not filled in or it's inaccurate. So what else do you have here? This is the identifying agency. Da, da, da. You can get information on the contractor, and this is what they've disclosed to the federal government. They've said that they say that they have 23 employees. This is their annual revenue. Are they a small business? No. So and so on. And you can sometimes you're supposed to see whether or not there was competition. And so here, competition category unknown, but then it says number of offers received, just one. So whether or not there was full and open competition or not, there was only one bidder. Um, so even if it was open, uh, there wasn't much competition at all. And you can see that even in bigger contracts too for weapon systems. So let's see if we can find a Northrop. Let's see, is it in here? Nope, it's still growing. So if we do, maybe if we go list of contractors, we can do this more, more quickly. So we'll let this grow a little bit, and we'll find a bigger defense contractor. So let's go down. We don't necessarily need Northrop. We could do Boeing. Well, the Boeing's not the best one. Let's see. Let's say we've got uh, General Dynamics. Just did about $100,000 of work in Buck McKean's district. What do they do work on? Ammunition. Let's see what we get. So if you if you get here, 
you can see basically a profile page for general dynamics work within Buck McKean's district in the year fiscal year 2008. You can see that <coughs> in 23% of the contracts they were awarded for work in Buck McKean's district, there was no competition. So, and you can do this for any congressional district, for any state, um, play around with the level of detail you know, find the contractors you're looking for. You might have to be patient, but you should be able to find some info. And again, that's usually a starting point. What if you want to find out what the Defense Department wants to do before it awards a contract? Well, there's a website called fedbizops.gov or fbo.gov. And when you get there, you see, you'll see this. My computer works, which it's not right now. Anyways, so I'll show you an example of a story that was done using FedBizOps. This is a story that uh, Wired Magazine's website ran a couple months ago. It was, a, it was a pretty good story, and it discusses how the Pentagon is outsourcing uh, a war on drugs as well and connecting the war on drugs with uh, the war on terror. So the story starts out that there's an obscure Pentagon office and they're soliciting an umbrella contract for security services. Uh, and it's pretty, pretty interesting. They talk about everything from training naval commandos in the country of Azerbaijan to providing helicopter training for crew members of the Mexican government to building anti-terrorism for the Pakistani border force. Pretty interesting. And he based that story off of this. This is a pretty pretty obscure notice. You know, it sounds kind of interesting though once you start reading. It's an announcement for a counterterrorism program office award. And so you go down and you can read basically a description of, of, of what they want. Pretty boring stuff until you read closely. And then they start talking about Oh, you need top secret security clearance. You won't just operate in the continental United States, but outside of the continental United States, including possible deployments uh, to theaters of war zones, possible army, ar personnel arming requirements are possible. And they go on and on and on what, in terms of what they want. You know, they want information about the companies and what they can do, representative things that the contractor might do if they get on the contract would be train Azerbaijan naval, naval commandos <coughs> and so on as, as I just mentioned. So if you go to FBO, let's see, let's try to go there. Um, hold on. If you try to go to FBO, you can basically search around and, and, and fiddle around and try to find out what the U.S. military wants in the, in the future. So if you just say last 30 days and say you want to learn more about what they want in the area of unmanned aerial vehicles, you could just put unmanned aerial and look at the solicitations in the last 30 days. And you can see that you know they're, they're advertising uh, or, or they want bidders to approach them on, on an array of tasks uh, associated with unmanned aerial vehicles. Guided missiles, so let's just go here. This is, this is just posted today. So the Army Aviation and Missile Commands in, intends on awarding a contract to support aerial target systems, probably for unmanned aerial vehicles. So let's just see if unmanned comes up. It doesn't right away, but it comes up somewhere, which is why this contract came up. So, you know, it. none of these things are going to be, you know, you're not going to snap your fingers and in a minute or two find a, a crazy scandal, I mean, although I guess it's possible. Usually this takes some poking around and searching, and you start to get a feel for these websites, and you start to connect the dots on particular contracts or, or solicitations for contracts, and, um, and you can basically start to come up with some very interesting things and start to track the military uh, much better. And so I, I, I'm, I'm going to show you only one more final thing, 
which is uh, if you want to learn more about the companies, or at least the top companies that are getting Defense Department dollars or, or U.S. government dollars in general, um, my organization has a federal contractor misconduct database that, unlike USAspending.gov, actually works right now. And if you go here, we've listed the top 100 federal contractors as of fiscal year 2010. And we're striving to make this database as comprehensive as possible and list instances of instances of misconduct or alleged misconduct. And so, you know, you can dive in and say, let's look at Lockheed Martin, which is the world's number one defense contractor. And they build the Joint Strike Fighter, as you saw a picture of earlier. And so you can get a whole host of information kind of from this one central point on Lockheed and these other big defense contractors. And by the way, most of the top federal contractors tend to be defense contractors. Not all of them, but, but for the most part, they, they, they tend to line up pretty well, especially the top 10. So you go here, and you can see basically a variety of types of misconduct. We have 57 instances in our database for Lockheed Martin alone. And so, you know, we'll just dive into one, let's say, uh, so here's one, uh, embezzle, embezzlement of PAC funds, fun times, billing problems with a rocket. <coughs> so you can zero in on this one, and we have a base, basically we have a synopsis of this instance of misconduct. Uh, it was brought in a lawsuit by the government, the Defense Department brought it. Um, we classified it as government contract fraud, and they won a $10 million settlement in court. And, uh, you know, in our synopsis, we, you know, basically described it as Lockheed disclosed errors in its billing uh, requests for three years after they were discovered internally. And then we also post usually the original source document for our synopsis. And so here we have the U.S. government press release, which announces the settlement. So, which, you know, here's the primary source document. We usually basically suggest that people quote the original source document rather than us directly. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, as, as you can see, you know, we have hundreds and hundreds of instances, and it's usually better to go straight to the source if possible. So, that's Lockheed. So what else can you do here? You can not only search by contractor, but you can search by the type of misconduct. So if you go to the left sidebar and you go to misconduct type, <coughs> and you open up that box, you can see a variety of types of, of categories that we've created um, to help us classify types of misconduct. And so you can go to, for instance, uh, environment, go sort, and this will show all the environmental cases or cases we've classified as environmental cases for the top 100 government contractors. So, you know, some have more, many more than others. Uh, here's BP, British Petroleum. They have quite a few listed here. And so this is sometimes good not just for researching military contractors, but for researching corporations more generally. So if, if they happen to be major government contractors. So I've, I've spent about 40 minutes talking, and I'm sure some of you have questions. So I'm going to just open it up right now for, for questions, and hopefully I can try to answer some of them, or all of them, hopefully. Great. Well, thank you so much, Nick. Um, Again, for all of you, if you want to ask a question, you can write it in the chat box, which you can open from the green uh, bar at the top of your screen. Um, or if you uh, just want to, um, you can also, I can unmute you if you want to just uh, chat with Nick, um, or you can <coughs> write, it, write it into the chat box. So I, I have a question for you, Nick, um, yeah. and, and that is, um, the um, you know for, from an activist point of view, I'm thinking about the how you affect 
the things once you find out about this information. So on the, the FedBiz Ops site, the FBO.gov website, mm -hmm. where you see uh, requests for proposals that are announced. Now, is that all for money that has all been approved by Congress? Or, or um, is any of it in any kind of uh, discretionary kind of category? That's a good question. I mean, typically the way this works is um, I mean, there's two sides. There's basically the, the budget and appropriations process. And so the way it's supposed to work, and it doesn't always work this way, and, and, and sometimes that can be a major problem, but the way it's supposed to work is every year um, the president's supposed to make a budget request to Congress, basically funding the departments and agencies at certain levels, and those departments and agencies will provide more detail on what they want to spend their money on. And they'll send that to Congress, and Congress is supposed to not only authorize spending levels uh, and also create a bu create budget levels for the various departments, but is also supposed to appropriate money. And that that happens uh, sort of in a dysfunctional way currently. Often appropriations bills aren't passed, at least not on time. But but that's that's sort of another ball of wax. And so <clears throat> usually a government agency. Yeah, they're not they're not listing every single contract that they want to award in the coming fiscal year when they submit their budget request. They'll say, uh, we want this much money for procurement, and kind of in some some more or less broad strokes, they'll say, um, we want to spend this mon much money on uh, unmanned aerial vehicles or this particular unmanned aerial vehicle, and usually Congress will you know, may say yes or may change it a little bit. Sometimes it zeroes it out. But Congress isn't approving contract by contract what happens, but will approve basically the funding levels that will fund that contract ultimately. That's the way it typically works. I mean, when you start <clears throat> getting into the CIA and how it it it, it funds things, uh, you know, sometimes there, it gets a little, it, get, it often gets very squirrely and doesn't work that way. There's certainly not as much transparency. And also within the DOD, there is some discretion to do what's called reprogramming. And what reprogramming is, is you know, money was appropriated for a certain type of thing within the DOD, and then DOD has some discretion to move some money around for, for things the money wasn't appropriated for. Although there are limits, um, I mean, the limits are at the several you know, at, at millions of dollars. And so millions of dollars can move around that Congress didn't approve of necessarily. So uh, the things are connected, but, um, you know, in general, yeah, Congress approves the funding level, but there's some flexibility there as well. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was kind of a long-winded answer. So, so what, it, what it may mean is that uh, if it's listed in the FBO site, Congress has signed off on a general amount. If you want to protest it, you might have more success going to the agency than to Congress, or well, you might. Um, your Congress, your member of Congress, could raise questions about the contract for sure, and and the, and the member of Congress mm -hmm. could say, um, "Hey, I'm not sure if if you know this money is being used in a way that is productive or useful from some point of view." Also, you could go to your member of Congress and say. Well, last year, the uh, Congressional Appropriations Committees approved funding for, for, say, unmanned aerial vehicles or cluster munition research. Uh, you know, we don't think they should be spending as much money on those things. Um, and so, Congress, you know, next time around, can you urge the, you know, whether or not your member's on the Appropriations Committee or not, your member could try to affect those appropriations levels. Um, and you know, tighten up spending in an area uh, where you don't think the funding is is productive or useful, <clears throat> or or used for for peaceful purposes. So yeah, you know, there there is a role for Congress in all of this. I mean, Congress ultimately does control the purse strings, and while it, you might not be able to affect the award of a particular contract, Congress could shut off the money flow to that contract too. Mm -hmm. Great. So again, I invite people to submit questions in the chat box uh, that you can open from the green bar at the top of your screen. Um, 
one other question that I have for you, Nick, is, you know, sometimes when you review these things, you see these acronyms, strange acronyms. All over uh, the place, yeah. All over the place. For someone who's particularly who's starting with this, um, what do you what suggestions do you have for people to try and um, you know make their way navigate their way through this sea of uh, kind of obscure terms and acronyms? Are there places that you go when you're when you see something that you don't recognize, or or how how did you learn, or how do you suggest people learn about that? Well, Google is your friend. Um, as as with most things, um, there's also a DoD acronym glossary, and the DoD acronym glossary that's online is only update updated to a certain. Uh, I think it's a couple years out of date, at least the most recent one I've seen, and that's only really useful for you know more of the DoD wide acronyms. I think you start to see acronyms that are only used by certain agencies or in really specific contexts. So it can be difficult. Um, the better, the better, say, contract solicitations will try to define or spell out what the acronym means. But sometimes, even when you see the full spelled-out version of the acronym, the the, the full version, um, sometimes it's hard to even decipher what that means. And so, <clears throat> you know, you can Google around, and you know, usually you'll find some sort of descriptor where you know someone's explaining it. Sometimes the trade press is written about some of these things. Um, so, you know, uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. The, the the worst thing anyone can do is make assumptions about what an acronym means because um, you might Google around and find that acronym, and it might be the same letters literally, but be referring to something totally different. And even if it seems obvious what the acronym is referring to, it's it's it never hurts to ask to 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 just be sure. Um, and who do you ask? Well, <clears throat> the DOD does have a massive public affairs department. Um <laughs> but that said, they can sometimes be difficult to get through to if you're especially if you're a member of the public. Um now, I've 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 dealt with some very great public affairs people and and they're great in a very narrow sense they're they're good at answering purely factual questions what does this acronym mean <laughs> what does this dollar amount mean you know they, they may not answer your your more fundamental questions about some of these projects um but if you can get them on the phone um sometimes they can be helpful there's also some great non-governmental resources out there as well um, you know, Pogo's one. Uh, there's there's groups like OMB Watch. There are, there's also some great um, weapons and military experts, uh, such as John Pike, that works at GlobalSecurity.org. Um, and you know, you might want to search out um, you know some of the NGO experts out there who are often more approachable than the government itself. Great. We have, a, we have a couple of questions here. Um, the first is from Seth, and he asks, um, how to investigate DOD contracts that support military recruitment and marketing efforts? Uh, what's the best That's way to focus on that area in, in particular? Um, if usaspending.gov worked right now, I could show you some things, uh, and, and you should email me offline. The, the short answer to that question is, what what they do with these contracts, as I mentioned earlier, there's services and there's goods. And so they'll code goods with a certain, um, I think it's either a letter or a number, and services the opposite way with a letter or a number. Uh, and, and they code them, you know, one will be, uh, I, I've seen it before, it's marketing and PR services. And so if you looked for DOD contracts for marketing and PR services, it's, it's something that's described that way more or less. Um, you might be able to narrow the universe of contracts to look at. And <clears throat> I have no doubt, actually quite a few of them relate to recruiting. Uh, a few years ago, there was a, uh, a minor scandal at the Air Force related to how the Air Force wanted to award a, a Thunderbirds air show contract. And the Thunderbirds for the Air Force are one of their main, or one of their recruiting tools. 
and so they wanted to hire this politically connected company to to, to put together the jumbotrons for the air shows. But um, yeah, there's a way to do that, and you should contact me offline. Just shoot me an email. Um, I'll, I'll move on to the next slide so you can see my email actually. And um, hold on a second. And um, yeah, you should ask me, and I could I could probably direct you to some info that could could help you out there. And maybe even if I don't know if uh, the agency within DOD that does recruiting would be the one to look for, but may, there might be a way within USAspending.gov to to uh, look for PR contracts from that agency. Um, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There, there are. I mean, just to wrap this up a little bit, that particular question is is that I think there are a few different places in DOD that that do work related to um, recruitment. Mm -hmm. So there's another question here, which is, um, if you want to obtain more information regarding the bidding process for a certain contract, what types of records exist around that process? And are some of those available to the public? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me show you some of this stuff over at um, the FedBizOps website. <coughs> so. So this is that narco-terrorism contract I, I briefly described. So during a solicitation, interested vendors can officially indicate their interest, um, and often they'll list them. You know, here you know here they have over 116 or over 100 vendors ex have expressed interest in trying to bid on this contract. They may or may not bid, and there may be companies that haven't officially expressed interest that might bid, and, and probably likely there are. And so this will give you a sense of some of the companies that are, are thinking about uh, bidding on this contract. Also, there is often info, more detailed info on what they're looking for with this contract. You know, we saw a pretty detailed description here. And sometimes there'll be there'll be links to um, oh this is it. If you read through this, you can get a sense of what they want. And then sometimes the interested vendors or other vendors will come back and ask the government questions about this this potential contract and say, well, what do you mean when you say this? And often those questions are made available to the public. So, and then so if if you're looking at it from from before they're awarding the contract, you can get you know some 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 info on 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 what's going on, who's interested or who's officially interested, and in, in really what the government's looking for. So it, I don't know if that fully answers the question, but uh, let me know if there's there's more I can say uh, to help you know, answer that that question. Yeah, I guess uh, maybe one question might be um, if you were going to request it through FOIA, uh, you know how you would frame that request and, and what might or might not be releasable under FOIA for those kinds of That's things that are, not, that are not posted on FBO. Yeah, uh, the challenging thing with using FOIA, I, I mean, besides the general problems with, with denial and delay is <coughs> with contracts, you're not going to be able to get, for instance, uh, a company's bid. Um, you're not going to be able to see their proposal, and what the government will say is they'll say that that bid is that company's, uh, you know, uh, you know, trade secrets. You know, that's usually where a company says, you know, we'll do it this way at this price, and the government, you know, has a FOIA exemption for that and won't want to undermine, um, you know, that company's, you know, bid information. Basically, that stuff is is very protected. Sometimes after a contract is awarded, there'll be what's called a bid protest. And so a losing company that's upset uh, that they lost the contract will, will often fi file this protest with the Government Accountability Office. And the Government Accountability Office will often, you know, to you know, make what's called a bid protest decision. And they usually don't sustain, but, but sometimes they sustain protests. And even when they don't sustain, sometimes you get info on um, the, the losing company's um, <clears throat> bid and the winning company's bid because after um, they've awarded a contract, they'll do basically a, a post-award briefing 
to all the win to the, to the winner or the winners and the losers, and they'll disclose certain types of information, sometimes redacted, and they'll say, well, you won on this basis, but they you lost on all these other basis on all these other points, and so in aggregate, that's why this company won. And so sometimes you'll see that in bid protest decisions. Well, they'll descri describe why one company won and why one company lost. And then, you know, sometimes you'll get some really great insight into um, how the, the the contract was awarded. And if they sustained uh, the protest, sometimes you learn about how it went awry. Mm -hmm. So uh, Michael asks, what are NI, NAICS codes, which I think are are listed in the uh, usaspending.gov and some of the other contract list sites. Yeah, it's basically like an industry code for, for a type of uh, a good. I forget what the actual acronym stands for, but it's a good question. It is the North American Industry Classification System. And so it's just it's a way to classify businesses. This, uh, does this company do mining? Does it do hair, you know, is it a hairstylist company or a hairstyling company? I mean, it's it's sort of broad broad brush. And there's also uh, SIC, which is, I forget what that stands for as well, but it's a counterpart to the to the NAIC code. Uh, but that's basically what that means is, you know, uh -huh. what type of industry. Uh -huh. Okay. Seth asks, are there, are there any open source trade publications that we should try and keep up with if we want to follow these things? Um, that's a great question. Um, some of the better ones, or some of the the the, the more commonly updated or, or or more aggressive ones, are behind paywalls. Um, you know, inside inside the Pentagon, which is run by a company called Inside Washington Publishers, does a lot of reporting on defense acquisition and defense contracting. Unfortunately, it costs money and it's not cheap. Uh, there are a couple of trade publications like uh, Flight Global International, which you know, is it's free or at least has a, a free thing, and there's a great reporter over there named Stephen Trimble, who runs a great blog on you know mostly you know aircraft and UAVs. Uh, Wired, Wired Magazine has a great defense blog called Danger Room, and they often write about contracts. Uh, for everything from the Joint Strike Fighter down to UAVs and 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 you know smaller contracts for private security contractors. So you know Stephen Trimble, uh, Danger Room. Um, what else is there? There's a a website called DoD Buzz, which is pretty good and it's free as well. So those are some some of the better um, uh, free trade publications out there that. I wouldn't classify Danger Room exactly as a trade publication, but they, they cover defense technology pretty closely, and so they're sort of on the border. Mm -hmm. But they also have sort of a broader audience as well. Mm -hmm. Well, one other question, Seth, and uh, this might be the last one, um, is uh, if you wanted to go back further in time than the kinds of things that are listed on, on the FBO site, it looks like that those are mostly just in the last year, what what would you do if you wanted to see uh, patterns or some kind of historical documentation um, further back in time? That's a great question. Um, the FPDS system, um, the Federal Procurement Data System, which is a feeder system for USA spending, is pretty good. It's got a lot of problems back to about 2001, <coughs> although it's got serious data problems the farther back you go um, and is, is very incomplete earlier than 07. Um, the Investigative Reporters and Editors, which is a nonprofit based out of Columbia, Missouri at the University of Missouri, they have a great uh, uh, database that they sell. And if, if you're a small nonprofit, they sell it for a, a deep discount. And they have a database of federal contracts going back to I want to say the 80s, um, possibly farther back. Um, now I'm, I'm not quite sure what the shape of their data is. You know, when you go back earlier than 2000, but um, but I know they have historical contracting data, and um, and and if you want to look back for the last couple of decades, they might be a good place to start. 
Okay, we have we have one more question, and then we'll wrap it up, which is um, uh, from Abby, and that is uh, if you have any general tips for searching on for foreign contracts and searching by region, country. And I'll just say uh, it's something because it's something I've done that uh, if you when if you use USAspending.gov, you can search for contracts by country of, by place of performance in in the country. Um, some of the other databases, it's a little bit more difficult to, to search by country, but um, you can get a, a list and, a, and download an exportable Excel file, for example, of all the contracts that were going to be performed in Honduras or in Afghanistan uh, for any department. And I don't know if, Nick, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, just, just one note of caution there, and, and, and John is absolutely right, and I've done the exact same thing he has, is you can look by place of performance. Um, but uh, again, with these data sets, there the data quality. There's some problems with data quality, and so, uh, and I'll just illustrate it with with one example. I was looking for uh, all contracts in Afghanistan, and this was a couple years ago. And so I went to USAspending.gov, put in place of performance uh, Afghanistan. Not much came out, and then I, on a whim, I put in place of performance you know, city Kabul, but left the country thing blank, and boom, it spit out a lot. And so, you know, with these databases, sometimes you have to play around, and if if sometimes you might do it uh, in a way that you think would work and it won't work, and sometimes you'll do it in a way that you know, shouldn't work as well and it works better. So these, these databases are a little hinky, um, especially the farther back you go. And, and one additional note of caution with USAspending.gov and FPDS is the DOD uh, doesn't have to report information on contracts uh, as, as, as early as the other agencies, and they get more leeway in terms of when they have to report that info. I think there's an, they get an extra, extra 30 days or 60 days or 90 days more than the other departments. And so if you're looking, especially in the last couple months, at DOD contracts, and you're you're thinking to yourself, well, it doesn't seem like there's as many contracts here as there should be. Well, there's a good reason for that, and that's because the DoD probably hasn't had to report on those contracts yet, as opposed mm -hmm. to the other departments and agencies. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Nick, for um, sharing your your experience with us. Uh, it's clear that um, there's a lot of work to be done to try and uh, understand military contracts and uh, be able to use that in, in our activism. So um, we encourage people to to contact Nick or myself, John Lindsay Poland, uh, offline. And um, thanks so much for participating with us. Hey, thanks, everyone. I appreciate uh, listening in.